folks, Labor Day weekend, it officially kicks off the mad dash to the midterms. In just over two months, voters across the country, they're going to cast ballots in races that will transform Congress. And that's pretty much the only sure thing about the 2020 midterms. Look, if you'd had asked me or any one of my Democratic friends their thoughts on November's election back in the spring, I'm sure we would have all said, get ready for a red wave. The stage truly seems set for widespread Republican victories. But with the reversal of Roe versus Wade and a woman's right to make decisions about her own body being left at the mercy of state governments, Democrats, they have seen a steady rise in support. It's a development that just might fly in the face of historical trends and allow Democrats to keep Congress blue. Two of the country's most consequential states is where we're going to start today. And first, let's go to Pennsylvania, where TV doctor Mehmet Oz is facing off against Democratic Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman for a Senate seat. And in the state's gubernatorial race, Democrat Josh Shapiro is taking on the Republican nominee for governor, state senator and January 6th rioter Doug Mastriano. We're talking Wisconsin also, where Republican incumbent Senator Ron Johnson is fighting in a challenge from the Democratic nominee and the lieutenant governor of the state. I'm talking about Mandela Barnes and Democratic incumbent Governor Tony Evers. He is fighting for a second term against the Trump-endorsed Tim Michaels. There's a lot, so here to discuss it all is our political panel. Bill Barrow is a national political reporter for the Associated Press. Jesse Moore is a Democratic strategist and founder of Common Thread Strategies. And Rena Shaw is a former Republican strategist. Welcome to you all. I would like to note that I've known Bill Barrow for a number of years, and I thought his name was Bill Barrow all this time, and it's Barrow, folks. Okay, Bill, you need to start correcting people out here in the streets about your name. Let's you start with my <laughs> thank you for being here. Let's start with my least favorite topic, y'all. Former President Donald Trump. He held his first rally since the FBI search of his Mar-a-Lago home last night. He was in Pennsylvania and he gave a scathing speech. He was supposed to be having this rally to support Republican gubernatorial candidate Doug Mastriano and the fellow reality store Mehmet Oz. And as I said, he's running for Senate. But in his full two-hour speech, he only mentioned the two of them a handful of times. Rena, what exactly is the point of a Trump endorsement if he's only going to focus on himself and not the candidates? Well, he doesn't really care what people think of him, right? That's the biggest thing here. The candidates that he has picked and endorsed across the country don't seem to be people that are all in on the Trump brand all the time. Some of them, I mean. So, so this is a reality here, is that Trump's strategy is not a real strategy. It's always about Team Trump. And I have a weird theory here, that the president, the former president, uh, President Trump, I, I have to be careful here, because President Biden, of course, tries to distinguish him. But he's very much a looming threat. He's, he continues to be this, this face of the Republican Party. And, and no matter what he does, it's as if nothing is going to get to him. So the reality is his... his his being out there in Pennsylvania is just a continuation of the Trump show. I, my crazy theory that I alluded to a moment ago is that he wants to hand this off to one of his children. I have a bizarre theory about that. I'd love to flesh out with Rita, you. Rita, it's a bizarre hour. theory. It's a bizarre theory. But you know what? Nothing makes sense nowadays. We've been using the term unprecedented. Okay, let's talk about some of these races. Because, Bill, the president's approval rating, it has risen, okay? It's above 40 percent. But there is a recent NBC News report that's found that some candidates in the swing states are hesitant to campaign with the president. Make this make sense to me. Where are their interests diverging, if you will? Well, one of those candidates you mentioned is uh, here in Georgia, Senator Raphael Warnock, who was on stage with, with President-elect Biden in those runoffs that everyone followed. The entire political universe was here. Now you watch Raphael Warnock run for re-election, and he barely mentions President Biden. But he's very bullish on mentioning things that have made it through this Democratic Senate to President Biden's desk. So it's a very, very odd needle for, for uh, Mark Kelly in Arizona, or Raphael Warnock in Georgia to try to thread. Uh, but that's sort of what you have to do when you have a president running in his first midterm with an uneven economy, with inflation, with uh, such deep divisions in the electorate. And I think that's just what we're going to see for the next 60 days. You're going to see Democrats try to talk about the Democratic agenda, Democratic values, 
They're going to juxtapose themselves with their opponents, try to mm. individualize these races as much as possible, and then leave President Biden out there to make his own umbrella message himself more on his own the way we saw him do uh, this week uh, as he went after President Trump. I mean, that makes sense, right? So we got Raphael Warnock in Georgia, who, uh, again, campaigned with the president when he was the president-elect, trying to get the job the first time. And now Raphael Warnock, he is, he is running a race very Georgia-centric. But then you've got folks like John Fetterman in Pennsylvania, who has said he will appear with the president. He will be with him tomorrow on Labor Day. But John Fetterman also has come out and said that he is going to press President Biden about de removing marijuana from the schedule altogether. Folks, right now, now, marijuana, uh, the president supports descheduling marijuana to a Schedule II classification so you can study it. John Fetterman is like, I'm going to press him to get rid of it altogether. Jesse, is that a good place, if you will, for these candidates to be? Emphasize, appearing with President Biden, um, talking about the wins, but also emphasizing where maybe they disagree and pushing him a little bit. Absolutely. This is this is what is actually needed in government. We forget about it in the modern media and the modern political environment. But actually talking about issues and Democrats pushing each other on policy, that's what government is. So a, a president has to be able to, a president and a governor need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. They need to be candidates and do what it takes to win. But they also need to be working together and and even against each other when they're pushing against each other. So I think this is a moment where the you know the president is kind of giving a, a do you approach to candidates, saying do what you need to do to win. Stand with me. Don't stand with me. And on the issues, we need to stand together because he has two roles right now. He's the head of a party. But 100 years from now, nobody's going to remember what happened in these midterms. They're going to remember what happened to our democracy and who was standing on the right side of history. Mm, standing on the right side of history. You know, Joe Biden himself has been a candidate. He will tell you he knows a thing or two. Let's definitely talk about Wisconsin. My favorite place, okay, Midwest girl. And we've got Republican Senator Ron Johnson, and he is trying to hold on for another term. But recent polls do show that his opponent, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, has a slight edge. In a recent town hall, Ron Johnson expressed support for a policy that would, quote, coax seniors out of retirement to earn a few extra bucks. Rena. what is he doing? How do you think America's most reliable voting bloc is going to react to this? Well, Ron Johnson seems to keep digging his grave, it seems. It's kind of odd. And, and But here's the thing about Wisconsin, is that there's a lot of love for Republicans there. And I think back to Simone, my time on Capitol Hill over a decade ago, when Ryan Priebus was turning 40, and I was there at his 40th birthday party thinking to myself, my gosh, the new Republican Party is a Wisconsin party. Don't forget people like Paul Ryan's uh, Paul Ryan, like I said, Ryan Priebus, the former chair in the RNC, Sean Duffy, a young congressman who went on to have a Fox career. I mean, these guys were all this club, and they would have this young energy, this cool energy, and Ron Johnson was injected in there. These people have a lot of love, and those roots are deep in Wisconsin. So I am very, very, not, I have to be honest, I'm very bearish about mm. the situation of Wisconsin. I, I, I don't think Ron Johnson has as bad of a chance as some people think he has. He keeps okay, saying Brianna. wild things, but there are roots. There are roots that cannot be discounted in Wisconsin for Republicans. All right. Well, Mandela Barnes is hoping to upset those roots. There are 65 days until the November elections. And though Democrats have a platform and a plan, people need to know more about it if they want to get elected. So let's get into that with my political panel. Bill, Jesse, and Rena are back. Okay. Bill, let's chat Georgia. We know you were at an event for Senator Raphael Warnock on Friday. Democratic candidates like the senator and Stacey Abrams are notably campaigning in rural, Republican-friendly counties. They're trying to get all these votes. We had a poster on recently who said that candidates like Mandela Barnes in Wisconsin and Stacey Abrams and Raphael Warnock in Georgia are going to also, though, need Obama-level numbers with black voters to win. So I'm interested in what you are seeing on the ground and uh, if Stacey Abrams and Raphael Warnock are making any headway. You know, Simone, it, it can sound a little tried in politics to say that battleground states turn on the margins, uh, but that is so true in a state like Georgia that not only is a battleground and closely divided, but so demographically and geographically diverse. That means there are so many different 
uh, leaders for the candidates to pull on, and one of those for Democrats is the, this rural area. I know the mayor mentioned Atlanta and Fulton County, and that you know nearly 12,000 vote margin for President Biden over over former President Trump. But the reality is, it took votes from everywhere in Georgia. And if you look at Abrams' battle against Brian Kemp four years ago when it was an open seat, Abrams did everything that she wanted to do in Metro Atlanta. Fell a little short and even lost ground compared to Democrats in previous midterms, 2014, 2010, was in those rural and small town Georgia counties that individually are not very big, but in a state with 159 counties add up to a lot of votes. If Stacey mm. Abrams had hit the percentages in the 60 least populated counties or so in Georgia that Jason Carter hit in 2014, she would be governor today. Oh, uh, wow. Raphael Warnock did do a little better in some of those places, particularly with black voters in South Georgia. It, it can be misunderstood, I think, from outside the South, especially, that black voters, black Democratic voters, don't just live in the cities. There are rural areas. And, and for Democrats to win here, they have to turn those voters out. Um, really quickly wanted to mention, too, though, I know you're, you were focusing on Democrats, but Republicans recognize this as well, and Republicans are making a big push. The RNC has invested in a lot of storefronts all over this state and other battlegrounds, including— and They're surging in, some money to uh, yes, particularly and, Herschel, Herschel Walker, um, one yeah. could argue. He needs the help. So there, there's going to be a big fight over over these votes. All right. Well, we're going to be watching Georgia. I want to play for you all some comments from the chair of the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Sean Patrick Maloney. He was on Fox News Sunday this morning. Take a listen to this. This is not Republicans versus Democrats. This is mainstream Republicans and Democrats versus MAGA extremists. This election is about mainstream versus MAGA. So it seems to me that Democrats are trying to take away this talking point um, from Republicans, that the president is, is being critical of the entire Republican Party. Sean Patrick Maloney making his case on Fox News to conservative voters, Jesse. Do you think that um, they're going to be successful, or will the tactic from some of my conservative friends just be to paint it with a broad base brush? Well, that'll be the tactic. I don't know that it'll be successful um, because, honestly, I think there is there are millions of Republicans and conservatives out there who are looking to be heard, looking to be seen. They've been drowned out for years now, and this is kind of a moment where I think the president of the United States, regardless of party, is is having a frank discussion to say, you know, we're not just talking about policy differences. We're not talking about midterm elections. We're talking about our country, and it, mm. you know, as uh, as kind of lofty as that might sound, these moments happen, and we, you know, throughout history, and we don't realize they're happening until it's almost too late. And I feel like the president is taking this opportunity to say, if you're conservative, I want to have policy discussions with you. If you're Republican, I want to have uh, policy debates with you. If you are a MAGA Republican, if you're somebody who has built an ideology around one man, around one political uh, figure, then you are harming our democracy. Um, and to have that frank conversation is, is, is brave. You know, someone else that is kind of taking this tact is Pennsylvania State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta. Folks might remember him. He uh, was in the primary for the Democratic uh, Senate seat in Pennsylvania. But now he's the chair of a new national PAC that is vowing to campaign against anti-LGBTQ candidates. Take a listen to his explanation about this earlier on MSNBC. Part of what we said was, how can we actually be in a position to be full-time focused on going after bigots, on beating beatable bigots all across the country, on actually taking the fight mm -hmm. to these people that want to roll back the clock and put us in a position where sure. we have right. fewer rights in the next 50 years than we had in the previous 50 the state representative is speaking to the idea of freedoms here. Rena, I cannot remember another cycle where I've heard so many Democrats make the case using the freedom language, but it seems to be working so far in the primaries. It's usually something I hear from my Republican friends. 
Well, as a former Republican speechwriter, I must say that that was a word I use a lot, liberty. A lot of what I heard from Joe mm. Biden the other night sounded much like it was out of Paul Ryan's playbook and something that I wrote about a decade ago, and even less so than that, five years ago. Let me put it this way, Simone. I know all this talk is wonderful, and it resonates with me because I'm a pro-democracy voter. That's the only thing on the ballot for me. But let's be real here. There's a large swath of independent and moderate people out there who are concerned about prices on the shelf. And I don't mean to pivot here, but as long as the economy feels like it's not so great, what is all this other talk for? And I don't, again, I am not a person who feels that way, but I talk to voters who are upset about prices on the shelf, still feeling high and not being explained to or talked to, excuse me, uh, with the explanation, very clear, explicit language about how Democrats are going to make the economy much, much better. And uh, until that happens, all these conversations are wonderful, but will they move the needle in these places where we need that needle to be moved? I'm not so sure. So again, I'm worried mm. about democracy, but I know that we need moderates and independents to believe Democrats. Well, I know we're out of look. They're telling me don't do it. We are out of time here. But I will just say, as a former Democratic strategist, if I were advising these campaigns right now, I'd tell them it's a both end strategy. You have to talk about what's happening on inflation, on the economy, the gains that Democrats have made, and how Republicans didn't help. But you also need to ring, ring the alarm because, as Michael Beschloss said at the top of this show, we are in very dangerous territory. Rena, Bill, Jesse, thank y'all very much.